the next speaker is um, Stefan Duma. Well, you should see the, the biography I have in front of myself, so it makes my job really difficult to introduce him. Uh, so Stephen is the Harry Wyatt Professor of Engineering and Interim Director of the Institute, uh, Institute for Clinical Technology and Applied Science. Um, his internationally recognized research on head and eye injuries has covered everything from concussion prevention in football to eye damage from fireworks. So Stephen, I, I have to cut some of these, but I try to um, refer to the, to the key highlights. Since 2017, Stephen has been um, the editor-in-chief of the Annals of Biomedical Engineering. It is a flagship, it is the flagship journal of the Biomedical Engineering Society, and he has also served on the editorial board since 2009. He has over 144 journal publications. Um, he has pioneered installing sensors in wireless sensors in uh, football helmets, and he has been collecting hundreds uh, of thousands of real world head impact data, which I believe we'll hear a bit more about this today. And he has developed some techniques uh, for recreating impacts in the lab. And actually I'm quite well familiar with the Virginia Tech helmet rating system, which is um, basically initiated by himself in collaboration with Steve Rosen. Um, so there is a lot more here, but I would give the platform to, to Stefan to, to talk about his pre um, uh, prestigious work. Great, thank you so much for that. Can you see the slides okay? Yes, it's fine. Awesome. Well, first, thank you. This is a tremendous honor to be presenting today. And I also want to recognize our team here. We have a wonderful team. Uh, you mentioned Dr. Rosen. Uh, we have a great team of physicians, athletic trainers, and engineers that really make all of this possible. Uh, I'm going to give a sort of a different kind of a talk today, something that uh, I, I hear this question all the time. Can, can helmets stop concussions? Uh, can head protection stop concussions? So I'm going to go over sort of the literature on that and my thoughts on how we need to think about this a little differently. Uh, just disclosure, one thing that's very important, uh, we, our group has no financial conflict of interest with any helmet manufacturer, Centra Technology. So I'm going to talk a lot about helmets and we, we have no royalties or any kind of contract with any company. Uh, we're funded from the NIH, the NCAA uh, and private foundations. So here's a basic question. I get this all the time. Can head protection reduce the risk of concussion? So I can't see all of you, but if I asked you to raise your hand right now, how many of you would raise your hand if I said no, they can't stop it? Uh, my guess is probably the majority of you would raise your hand and say, no, they can't, they can't reduce the risk of concussion. I also find this varies by discipline. So if I ask a bunch of engineers, they're gonna say, yeah, maybe it does. If I ask clinicians, physicians, and MDs and DOs, they're almost unanimously going to say, no, helmets can't do anything for concussions. Uh, it's very interesting. So I want to broaden this, and maybe this is a nice way to wrap up this session, because I'm going to talk a little about auto safety and tie it into what this means. In 2011, uh, Dr. Guskowitz and Dr. Mihalik in North Carolina wrote this really nice summary article about biomechanics of sports concussion, and they basically posed the, all the different problems. Some people get concussed at low acceleration levels. Some get a lot of high impacts and never get concussed. It's a combination of linear and rotational. It's very complex. We don't know everything. Uh, but what I would say is we know enough to make some conclusions. So let's talk about the automobile safety analogy. Uh, many of us who work in sports biomechanics did a lot of work in the 90s and 2000s when airbags were first being developed and seatbelts were first really being heavily implemented. Uh, to, to understand how people get hurt in car crashes. And we heard Claire gave a really nice summary of that, and we've talked about some brain models. Uh, but what we know is that all over the world, there's active research in every body part. Head injury, neck, chest, femur fractures, tibia, ankle complex, pelvis, uh, abdomen. We don't know 100% about any of these regions, but we know enough to make some basic recommendations that we know are reducing injuries. And it really boils down to this, acceleration, force, stress, strain, whatever metric you wanna use, if you lower that on the human body, you lower your injury risk. When we talk about the human body, we, we all generally accept this and we understand this, but then when we go to concussions, we sort of stop talking about this. And we sort of make a giant disconnect. And that's really the point of my talk today. I'm gonna to talk about this uh, and I'm gonna talk about it relative to 
what I call football, but I'm going to be clear today that I'm going to talk about American football, and then I'm going to talk about real football or soccer at the last third of the lecture so you can sort of see the two different sports uh, and how hand protection can maybe reduce some of the risk. So let me ask you another question. If I asked you to raise your hand, can airbags reduce the risk of death in car crashes? I would say, and I've done this to audiences, the vast majority, of you, there's about a thousand people online now, the vast majority of you would raise your hand and say, yes, airbags can reduce the risk of death in car crashes. I agree with this. That's true. And I'll give US numbers, United States numbers, about a little under 3,000, 2750. Those are the number of lives saved each year. Well, let me give you this other number. 30,000 people die every year in America in car crashes, and all of those have airbags. Okay, so think about that. Now, let me make it a little more simple. What about seatbelts, right? A lot, everyone, if I ask you this question, can seatbelts reduce the risk of death in car crashes? You raise your hand. Everybody here, probably 100% would say absolutely. We all believe in and agree that seatbelts reduce the risk of death in car crashes. And that's engineers, and that's physicians. Universally, we agree with that. In, in America, these are U.S. numbers, uh, 15,000 lives are saved every year uh, by wearing seatbelts in car crashes. But we still have 20,000 people die in car crashes wearing seatbelts. So if I make that analogy to helmets, and this is what I get, is that people wear helmets, they still get concussions. That's true. People wear seatbelts and they still die, although we do save people. So there are limits to all these technologies, and it's really a balance. So I ask you to kind of keep that in the mindset as I walk you through American football and some of the historical research done in this area. What about skull fracture? Okay, when we talk about helmets and head protection, it's universally accepted that helmets and head protection reduce, the, reduce skull fracture, if not eliminate skull fracture. So let's look at where that data came from. Most of you are probably familiar with the Wayne State Tolerance Curve, but what you're probably not familiar with is some of the minutia around the Wayne State Tolerance Curve. Uh, they dropped four unembalmed cadaver heads. The tolerance curve itself is derived from six data points shown here on the right. Six data points, a hand-drawn line uh, between them. Think about the complex sort of uh, data that was just presented this morning and this afternoon, uh, how far we've come. But this basic, very simple curve in 1960 laid the foundation for everything we do in, in terms of helmet protection. It started the Wayne State Tolerance Curve, and this has been heavily criticized, but the bottom line is the Wayne State Tolerance Curve serves as the basis for all head injury standards, whether you're using HIC, SI, peak linear acceleration. This really is the fundamental precept of preventing skull fracture. In America, it started NOXI, and this is used in all different uh, standards around the world. Uh, in the 60s, if you played American football, there were 32 fatalities that year. Uh, pretty striking when you think about it. Uh, today, if we watch the NFL or college or any American football, you don't expect people to die. A lot of people were dying back then. Uh, NOXI was formed, tests were developed, and based on that Wayne State tolerance curve, they implemented a policy in standards, and that reduced 88% of the fatalities and severe head injuries in, in American football, basically by using the Wayne State tolerance curve as a method to limit the amount of energy we're putting in to people's heads. So if I asked you, can we predict, can we prevent skull fracture in sports, in helmeted sports? Again, probably 100% would say, yes, we can do that. The helmets are great at that. But let's look a little more closely at that. Some more recent research. This is a paper we published in 2011, some work we did for the military. We really carefully characterized the exact force it takes to cause a skull fracture. And I'm going to talk about frontal bones here. So what does it take to, to cause a skull fracture with an impact to the, to the frontal bone? I won't go into all the statistics, but let me let me talk about this plot for a little. So on the on the vertical axis, I have risk, so risk of skull fracture, and then we have force on the horizontal axis. The black dots are all cadaver tests that resulted in a fracture, and the green tests are all the tests that didn't result in a fracture. And then we have all different sorts of statistical combinations to make risk functions out of this. Let me point out some things that are pretty interesting. Look at the bottom right here. Look at all these green dots. Those are tests where we dropped the impact when there were no skull fracture. So think about players that get hit extremely hard repeatedly, and we don't see any concussions in them. We see the same thing in skull fracture. People are different. Uh, tolerance to all sorts of loading for all sorts of body parts is very different. It's all about risk. The more load you apply, the more times you're going to have a fracture and the higher probability. 
but it's not perfect. You can pick any force you want, 2,000 newtons, 3,000 newtons, 4,000 newtons, and you're going to get a high probability of skull fracture, but it's not an exact number. So if I asked you that question with this plot, can we predict skull fracture? Sure, we can predict it, but there's a probability associated with that prediction. It's not an absolute, and that's the same way for every body part. If you take all thousand of us that are watching this talk and put us all in the same car and the exact same car crash, you're going to get some patterns, some similar injuries, but you're also going to get distributions. Some people are going to have rib fractures. A lot of the young people in the audience aren't going to have any rib fractures. Well, elderly people might have much more severe injuries, liver lacerations. So the distribution is very extensive. Uh, there's sex differences. There's age differences. There's all sorts of differences that come into this. And the same applies for concussions. This slide here, I usually give about a two hour lecture on, but I'll, I'll run through the basic four different types of data that we have. We have all the cadaver data from the 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, when the airbags and seatbelts were first being designed. Uh, we have a lot of primate data uh, where live primate work was done in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Of course, this isn't being done anymore, but, but there's a lot of valuable data there. Uh, the NFL data came about in the mid 90s and, and has a lot more in the past five years. And then the volunteer data that was alluded to where we started instrumenting American football players with accelerometers. And now we have over 5 million head impact data points uh, from people playing American football from nine years old all the way through to 20 years old. All four of these data sets over 60 years show the same thing. If you lower linear and, ro and rotational acceleration, you lower the risk of head injury. Now that's skull fracture and that's brain injury. All of these data sets show the same thing. Lower acceleration, lower risk. So helmets aren't the answer. Of course, we agree with that. And I want to add this one slide just to comment on that. There's really three fundamental things that, that we can do to reduce the risk of concussion in sports. Uh, we can affect the rule changes. And if you've looked at sports in the past couple of years, there's been dramatic changes. Head-to-head -head contacts not allowed, uh, the type of formation, whatever sport it is. So rule changes, proper techniques, so the coaches are teaching the right thing. And then the third part, better equipment. That's what I'm going to focus on today. But I don't want to give this talk without recognizing that there are two other very important aspects to this. We looked at some youth studies where we took away this sort of practice, this head-to-head -head impact, and we replaced it with padding. And what we found, I'll summarize here on the bottom left, is if you just change the way kids tackle in American football, the average kid can go from 300 head impacts a year to 158, so cut it in half. So again, rules and the way you teach are dramatically important. Now let's talk about what we can do with the helmets. So what helmet do you want to buy? That's where we came into this in 2009, looking at uh, how helmets perform differently. These are two American football helmets that you could buy in 2009. Dramatically different impact results. So just let's look at peak acceleration, 190 Gs down to 84 Gs. Dramatically different. Same thing applies for youth football helmets. These differences are not tiny. From a three-star helmet, 130 Gs, to a five-star helmet, 62 Gs. These are the same impact. That's a tremendous amount of padding and, and cushioning that helps. It lowers acceleration. Same thing for rotation, over 5,000 to 2,000. So we're talking about cutting acceleration levels in half with, with better products. So if you have a youth football helmet, a varsity football helmet, you can look at our helmet ratings. Uh, the NFL in the past five years has also done a great job of releasing uh, helmet ratings for NFL players. Now they're hitting the helmets harder than we're hitting them. And there's, so that we encourage people to kind of look at all the data. So let's look at on-field data. This is a 2006 paper, which showed that there was a 31% lower risk of concussion on the field. Uh, this paper was widely criticized. Uh, there was some conflict of interest. So it's kind of been put aside. Basically it's comparing the revolution on the left to the VSR on the right. Of the revolution simply has more padding. So we did a study in 2012 that eliminated a lot of those problems uh, and we found that the better helmet reduced risk by 85 percent. What I think is the best study on this was done in 2014 and this is where we looked at eight universities and we had instrumentation in every single player's helmet so we knew how many times they were hit. This took away the error or the potential error of well if you're comparing your kickers to your middle linebackers or your running back. So we could normalize by exposure. And that's actually the best way to do it. And we could normalize it across eight different universities. So you have different positions making diagnosis. Uh, 
And what we found here is about a 54% risk reduction. The better helmet has better padding, it lowers head acceleration, and we see the difference in on-field diagnosis. Now let's look at a couple of the other papers that found different things. Uh, here's a paper from Dr. McGuire that showed on the bottom that regardless of helmet brand, there was no difference. Now this is where you have to be very careful because all helmet brands, Rydell and Shutt make very high performing helmets and they make low performing helmets. So brand doesn't mean much. And if you go into the paper and you look at the data, they're basically looking at really good helmets. There's eight VSR4s, three VSR4s compared to thousands of the very good helmets. Another study by Collins, very similar thing. They found that there's no difference in helmets, but they're only looking at good helmets. There's no VSR4s here. Uh, and the air HP is small, 900 compared to 10,000 uh, revolutions in speed. So you, you got to make sure you're looking at good helmets versus bad helmets. Okay, let's talk about soccer. Soccer for the world. Uh, we've done a lot of work in the past few years instrumenting soccer players. Uh, we use this technique. This is the Wake Forest retainer that Joel Stitzel's group makes. And uh, you basically custom fit this and we can track head acceleration uh, for people playing soccer or real football. Now, this paper, British Journal of Sports Medicine, the most recent paper just came out, again, by Dr. McGuire. Does soccer head care reduce the incidence of sport-related concussion? Uh, a big, big question. And their basic conclusion is soccer head gear does not reduce the incidence of concussion in sports, in soccer. So why is that? So let's look more carefully and more detailed at this paper. Here's the type of headgear that they use. And if you're familiar with this, you'll recognize some of these names. Full 90, Force Field, Storelli, Unequal. Lots of different headgear. Now, let's pull out a couple of these, the Force Field and the Storelli. Force Field, we give it a three star. Storelli, we give it a five star. Much lower head accelerations compared to the Force Field. And if you read detailed and buried in the back of the paper, you'll find this sentence. Our, our results show players were in Force Field had a sports-related concussion incidence of 5.4%. Players that wore Storelli had 2.5%, almost half. That's about exactly what we predict in the lab. Now, this their study blended everything together. So if you take all the good helmets or all the good hair protection and all the lesser performing hair protection, wrap it all up, everything kind of washes out. But if you take them apart and you look at, okay, here's a three-star versus a five-star, you see half the risk. And that's where a lot of the helmet ratings come from. It's really, how do we lower acceleration? What does that look like in soccer headgear? If you look at linear acceleration with no head, so two people go up to head a soccer ball, 178 Gs. That's a big, big impact. We see it all the time. Um, you expect injury in this case. Five-star helmet cuts that down to 88 Gs. Same thing in rotation, 12,000 to 6,000. So there's a huge difference in these ability of these different head protections for soccer uh, to reduce risk. Two-star reduces some of the acceleration, barely reduces some of the rotational, but again, it's going from that really poor to the best is where you see that half, that 50% dramatic reduce in acceleration and, and reduction in um, concussion risk. These data right here, importantly, are only if one player is wearing a headband. If both players are wearing a headband, you'd see even more reduction in acceleration. What does it look like on a wrist function? Uh, there's lots of wrist functions out there. This is one that we derived using a lot of the on-field data. You have rotational acceleration on the vertical axis, linear on the, on the horizontal. So the bare heads up here in the right, 12,000 radians per second squared, 178 Gs, 100% risk of head injury. Put a five-star headband on it, you cut the accelerations in half, and now you're at 23% risk. So we think that this definitely shows that you can reduce the risk. It doesn't eliminate it, lots of other variables, but we think it definitely lowers acceleration and it definitely lowers risk of concussion. Uh, you can go on the website and see this for any sport. We use the same sort of analysis for bicycles, youth football, now flag football, which is becoming very popular uh, in the United States uh, and soccer as well. So I'll close with that question again. Can head protection reduce the risk of concussion? Think about what we talked about with seatbelts and airbags. It's not an absolute, okay? There's about reduction in risk, and that's what we're talking about. So my answer is yes, within the context of what we've talked about today. It's about probability, not absolutes. It's a complex uh, issue. There's linear, there's rotation. There's all sorts of other factors that we're getting into now. Sex is a big difference. If you look at the clinical studies and you carefully look at what they're evaluating, 
lower rated helmets show higher risk of concussion than the higher rated head protection. They can reduce both linear and rotational accelerations. And if you look at all the research, the cadaver research, the primate research, the research from the NFL, and there's new studies coming out from the NFL that are not published quite yet, but basically agree with this. So they're seeing this in a very isolated group with the NFL, this reduction with better helmet performance. If you take all this into context, yes, helmets and head protection can reduce the risk of concussion in sports. And with that, I'll be very happy uh, to take any questions you might have. Thank you very, Thank much. You very much, Stephen. Uh, very nice, very interesting talk. Um, so I'm now looking at some of the questions posted here. So um, the first one, is, well, we have a mix of questions, some are for David, so David, take your time to answer these questions. So there's a question here from Jessica. Um, early question already, but have you done any research into head impacts, concussion rates in rugby union? We have a lot of work going on right now, and that's really, I want to give credit to Dr. Steve Rosen and one of his grad students, Emily. She's finishing up her PhD right now. Uh, we're doing a lot of work on rugby. Uh, I showed you that Wake Forest uh, mouth uh, retainer system. So we have that in rugby. And one of the reasons we're looking at rugby is now we can really get to look at uh, sex comparisons. We know there's difference between men and women. Uh, so we're doing a lot of work on instrumenting men and women in rugby. Uh, there's a lot of high head impacts. There's a lot of concussion. Uh, there's even uh, nasal fractures and skull fractures that you still see in rugby. So we're looking at that very closely as a really good opportunity to understand better what's happening. Uh, so yes, we are doing that. Okay, thank you. The next question is um, from Fedi Abayazid. Um, what do you think of the research in fluid liners? And will they prove uh, more promising than existing helmet liners with foam lattices? So the, always the issue with fluid is the weight and what people will tolerate. Uh, helmets are getting heavier. And, and we're talking about American football. They're getting heavier now, pushing four pounds and a little bit more. Um, so there's a concern that what, what players will tolerate. Uh, but the real issue and what I want to stress with the, the helmet technology is if you look at American football helmets, they're really good. They're about 95% optimized. You can do a quick calculation for how much space you have, what kind of padding. Uh, there's there's not a lot left there. Maybe there will be some brand new uh, material or combination, but but we need to set American football aside and realize that's one percent of the world sports and the world concussions. Uh, where there's huge room for improvement is every other sport. So these other materials, let's look at hockey. Let's look at soccer. Uh, let's look at bicycling. That's where we really need to focus on. There's huge room for improvement in those sports. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question from Rebecca Kenny. Uh, can you clarify what head impact in soccer resulted in 178 G of linear acceleration? Right. So this is a bare head. So this is head to head, heading a heading a soccer ball uh, with a closing speed of four meters a second, which is not really that fast. Um, let me give you some comparison. That if when we're looking at football helmets, we'll test up to seven, eight, nine meters a second. So we're not talking about people running full speed at each other. We're talking about people that you see all the time if you watch soccer that go up and head to head and miss the ball head to head contact if you, if you feel your forehead there's no padding here you bump heads super high acceleration so 178 g's is basically two people trying to head the ball but they head each other uh, very high impact and almost always uh, an injury okay thank you um another question which is actually quite long so i try to read and um try to shorten so Oli Duncan, so excellent talk, really enjoyed it. Uh, well, it has just moved. I think the team has moved it. Oh, it's gone up. Yeah, so I just have a question about instrumenting helmets and probably also skin mounted systems. How confident can you be that observed trends are reliable? Helmets compress and move relative to the head during impact. Some recent work suggests that such measurements can be highly variable and should they be taken with a pinch of salt or are the trends still reliable? Absolutely, this is a great point. Uh, one of the things I always like to point out is the HIT system, the helmet mounted system, you know, that's 20 or two decades old. We started using this in 2003. Um, it's not perfect. Uh, you know, I would like to talk about 10 to 20%. You know, sometimes it can be more variable. Uh, we do a lot of work to try to reduce that error. We video verify every impact, which takes a lot of time. Uh, 
but it's an old sensor. So, you know, I talked about the Wake Forest retainer, uh, Stanford, uh, Dave Camarillo has a retainer, uh, Adam Barsh uh, with Prevent. There's a lot much better, more accurate sensors out there now. They take a lot of work. You still have to video verify. Um, but I do think when you look at trends and you make sure you're looking at the right data, 10 to 20% difference isn't a huge difference. And I'll give you a specific example. Let's say you're looking at a 40G impact. What's a 10% variation on that? 36 to 44, there's no difference in those. Now, if it's 100% off, uh, that's a big difference. But I do, I have a lot of confidence uh, in the data and the trends. And, and if you look at how the data match to the NFL data, it's very, very consistent. If you look at how it matches to the primate data, there, there's very consistent uh, predictive possibilities there. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question from Tom. Do you think um, um, soccer helmets, headbands can help against the cumulative effects of repeated ball headings? This is a great point, and this is a great point for all sports. I, in my opinion, the field has moved away from this single event, this, okay, let's talk about just concussions, to all the head impacts. The growing research shows that we need to look at the cumulative effect, uh, soccer, football, hockey, whatever it is. And the reality is we don't know the exact answer. We don't know how much is too much, uh, what's the time frame between these impacts. But I think we would all agree that if you take this cumulative um, acceleration exposure and you lower it, that's probably better. Uh, so I want to be careful to say we don't know the, the exact amount. But I think we would all agree that if we lower every one of those impacts a little bit, uh, that's going to help. Yeah. Um, so this is the last question. And actually, I've chose this because um, um, this is also my question in terms of the definition of the concussion itself. So the question is from uh, Nazneen. Uh, one issue with the sports concussion is that diagnosis is very subjective. So have you looked at more objective measures of brain injury in relation to the effect of helmets? Absolutely. That's a great question. Um, and I, I sort of I, I went very quickly, but. If you look at a lot of the on-field studies, that's always one of the big question marks is, well, this school diagnoses this, this school diagnoses this. And there's some classic studies from the NFL where NFL teams will report zero concussions for the course of a season. Uh, so clearly there's differences in how these things are diagnosed. Um, we're all looking for that holy grail. So in parallel to all these studies we've talked about, there's a tremendous body of work uh, looking at all sorts of neurocognitive tests, eye tracking. Um, and really what we want is biomarkers. So there's a lot of great work going on with saliva biomarkers. You know, there's blood draw biomarkers. That's kind of hard to do on the field. Uh, but boy, if we could swab saliva and get a quick meeting, a definitive quick measurement, that's the goal. I don't think anybody's quite there yet. There's some, some things that are showing some, some positive trends, uh, but absolutely there is tremendous variability in how these things are diagnosed. They try to make it consistent, uh, but you have to look at that when you look at these studies. It's a big, it's a big confounding variable. And ultimately, I think we would love to have a biomarker or we'd love to have a, another type of visual or some sort of test on the sideline that's very definitive. Okay. Thank you very much, Stefan. So uh, with this talk, actually, we come to the end of the biomechanics session. I guess the next session starts right after this one. So thank you very much, everyone, for your contribution to this session.